No, see there. Hi everybody, Sean James here from My Self Reliance. Welcome back to the cabin. Welcome to my fireside. Wanted to uh, talk to you guys a little bit more in this video, which is unusual. And if you could, at the end of the video, just let me know what you think of this type of video on this channel. Or if this is something you think you'd rather just see me upload onto my other channel, Sean James, where I do tend to talk a little bit more. But I'm feeling like uh, this year I need to um, let you in a little bit more and show you exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it instead of just doing the long silent videos of me working or just doing working on this channel I'd rather sh start showing you the entire outdoor lifestyle that I'm creating here so this is part of it um, what Callie and I are doing today is that we're into the back country quite a ways back from the cabin and uh, we're exploring the area looking for for uh, fishing game so today specifically game uh, we got this rabbit this morning um, haven't seen many actually and not that many tracks so a little bit disappointing uh, however this is what I need to do I need to start learning the, the land here so that's going to take some time this year in particular now I found uh, quite a few uh, edible mushrooms on our land uh, we do seasonally have um, quite a bit of game there's bear and, and deer and moose occasionally uh, grouse very occasionally rabbits um, the odd raccoon and things like that so I need to get out and explore more and get back into the, the public land well behind the cabin and to go and explore that other property that I was telling you about in a previous video need to learn more about all of these areas where seasonally I need to move around to or um, focus my time on in those certain places where game tends to congregate um, seasonally like I said our, our um, forests are so vast here that the, the animals tend to well first of all they migrate quite a bit or they move around quite a bit with the food sources and, and depending on the weather and also uh, get you get these microclimates that are more productive than others so these edges beaver ponds like this are, are highly productive so the game is it's widely dispersed but then when you find a good area a good habitat you tend to get a lot more animals in those areas and maybe vast areas where there's nothing so that's my challenge um, 
especially this year and forever more I guess I need to get better and better at living off the land this is a huge part of self-reliance uh, being able to you know being able to create shelters and and winter camp sleep in a place like this that's all very valuable skills bottom line at the end of the day is food and water you need those things you need warmth but food and water is the I would say the more difficult thing to deal with um, to to try to live off the land as much as possible in an area like this is difficult so it, yeah, I would say it's the you need a more vast um, you know, bank of knowledge uh, in order to do that than, than you do just to learn how to uh, light a fire and build a shelter for example so I, I think that's valuable to share my experience as I'm learning this on on this channel um, I do have a lot of outdoor experience hunting and fishing in particular I've been doing I've been hunting officially since I was 15 when I got my, my license and I've been fishing since I was like three or four years old. So I'm pretty decent at both of those things. Now foraging for wild uh, plant material I'm less unknowledgeable about. So that's my challenge this year to learn as much as possible about those things. But I do have a lot to learn about all of it including the hunting and fishing. So as I, uh, as I do that, I want to share what I'm learning a little bit more rather than just showing you me doing those things. So I hope you're okay with that. I'd like to hear your opinion, what you do think of that. Um, so in this particular case, what I would like to do is show you uh, what gear I brought along with me today, how I chose this spot to cook the rabbit up, and how uh, the possibility of me and Callie staying the night out here influenced my decision on this location. Actually the sun's trying to peek out through the clouds here. It's been on and off snow and beautiful light snow but um, it's threatening to, to keep snowing harder but this sun peeking through I think is probably maybe um, coming early. It's tomorrow is supposed to be sunny. Anyway it's just about uh, the end of, of winter. It's a couple more days left uh, before March 21st and then uh, officially spring starts however so much snow on the ground it's gonna be late spring this year at least uh, late for seeing the, the actual ground I think what I'll do first of all I'll show you what I'm doing here with the rabbit so this fire I've got here what I did is I dug down as close as I could get down to the ground um, bare ground so there is still some snow and ice under here and because there is what I did is I created a whole base layer of hardwood on the ground and then I built the fire on top of that um, which is a great way to do it because if you build right on the ground you end up getting the cold sucks the heat out of the fire and also as it melts as that melts it turns to water at the bottom of the fire pit and ends up putting your fire out so I'm sitting in a hemlock or a deciduous or a so I'm sitting in a coniferous forest, a grove right here, which is typical of the low-lying areas. So around beaver ponds, lakes, and rivers, we typically get these coniferous forests, these evergreen forests. So I've got spruce, a hemlock, a white pine, a balsam fir, and cedar are the main conifers right here. And then, I, and then there's maples po poking up quite a few maples, some beech, uh, the odd birch tree, there's a dead birch tree that I took, got the birch bark from to, to make this fire. Um, what else? Some, yeah, lots of paper birch across the, the water here. And there's oak in this area up on these ridges. So with a f cooking fire, you don't want to cook with conifers if you can avoid it. First of all, it sparks a lot, doesn't create as much heat, it burns too quickly and you know, it gets a flame that ends up burning your food and uh, in parts not a very good flavor in the meat. So what I've done here is I got that base layer of hardwoods, uh, hardwood logs that I cut with the axe, with the hatchet. I laid those down first. I built a coniferous for, uh, fire on top of that mostly with spruce. I find hemlock is probably the worst for starting fires. Um, and I would say spruce is the best, it's the hottest, quickest, and good kindling. So I use the birch bark and then the spruce uh, twigs, uh, some fir twigs, and a uh, little bit of hemlock. 
got pretty good hot fire going and then that caught the hardwood. So I'm cooking with the hardwood because that does not impart a, a bad flavor. It's a more even heat and it's a hotter flame or hotter, um, well yeah, flame and coals than the softwood which just disappears really quickly. So what I mainly have done here is I have the hardwood underneath the, the rabbit and for a warming fire for me I was burning the coniferous stuff out here closer to me so I could get a higher flame. Now I'm starting to let that die down because I'm warm enough but the uh, hardwood I'll keep burning because that'll burn all night if I want it to. If I don't, if I decide to leave then I'll, I'll just uh, douse that in snow, put it out fully. I always like cooking with a lot of smoke on a when I'm cooking meat like this over the fire too. I like that flavor. That's getting to be almost done. So if you've seen my winter camping videos in the past, they're pretty well well. Where's Callie going? All my videos of camping when I'm especially solo. Callie, what are you up to? Do you smell something? Kelly heard a bird or what she did. Anyway, if you've seen my uh, winter camping videos in particular or any of my uh, sort of uh, fall videos where weather is an issue because it's getting colder, I tend to choose locations next to big rocks like this. And uh, the reason for that is that it's twofold. One is that it creates a natural shelter, a barrier from the wind, so a wind block. And then the second thing, it acts as a fire reflector. So what I'll typically do, two ways that I'll do it, uh, depending on how cold it is and how much uh, protection I want. One is to do it this way, where I have the fire out in front here, and then there's a space alongside the rock for me to sleep against or even sit up against. That's nice because having my back like this against the rock means there's no wind hitting me in the back so it's not co cooling me from behind and the fire in front of me gives me that full warmth of course every time the smoke goes right to the camera and then the other thing is that this um, well two things so one is that the fire bounces off that rock and kind of reflects back so I'm, it's acting sort of as a reflector for that as well uh, now the other thing I typically do is make sure I'm facing south so rocks on the north side here uh, that's south over there so it's not quite perfect for that but that's west and what's happening is as the sun is moving across the sky it is kind of shining through here across this beaver pond and I mean if it was a little bit warmer a little bit clearer and south facing I could be almost shirtless even though it's March just because of the intensity of that sun so that's the one way I do it. Uh, second way I'll, I'll do it maybe almost as often is I'll put the fire up against the rock and then I'll sit in front of it and try to create a snow shelter or a tarp shelter behind me. So then it, I've got the best of both worlds. I've got the fire reflecting off this huge stone surface and also heating it up and that will actually hold the heat a good part of the night. Um, two dangers, they're less uh, ideal things about that setup. Um, one is that often there will be moisture in the rock or fissures with moisture or ice in there and as you heat that up it will actually pop the rock so it will break the rock or explode it. Never had that happen in like a dangerous explosion but I have had quite often pieces will uh, break right off and sometimes significant pieces. Second thing is that you've got to look up that's really annoying the smoke. Second thing is if you look up here that's solid ice mainly because the sun does shine in here melts that and then the water starts coming down and then refreezes so there's a huge block of ice on this whole thing and snow above it so the danger is that when you have a fire up against that it's heating all of that up and all this starts melting in on the fire or it could even sort of have a little mini avalanche that douses the fire completely and if, count, if I'm counting on that fire for heat to keep me warm at night because I don't have like a full sleeping bag or something then 
it could be a dangerous situation. So you want to avoid that. One way to do it is to clear all the snow and ice off first before you have your fire. And secondly, keep it back far enough from the rock that it's not heating it up so much that it's melting stuff. However, that defeats the whole purpose of the rock, in my opinion, in that case. So two things to watch out for. So the other thing about this spot, and the other reason I chose it, as you can hear, it's quite windy. I think 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers an hour, kilometers an hour they were calling for today. Um, it's dropping down again to minus 14, I think, tonight. So it's still wintry, and uh, the wind can get quite cold. So this is fairly sheltered in here. Now, often if it's really cold and uh, snowy, and I'm staying out for a couple of days, I'd want probably more cover. I'd get into thicker coniferous forest, which there is across the pond here and a couple other spots, um, just to get less snow on the ground and just more shelter from the wind. So a little bit warmer. Um, the other thing is, though, you need to make sure that you have a good fire supply, firewood supply nearby. So that's part of the other reason I, I chose this area. I've got two or three dead maples. Cut the one down already that I used for this fire. And I have more. And they're long enough, big enough trees that um, I can do long fires, like I've started here. So I can have a long fire kind of length of my body all the way along here so that I have full warmth. I didn't bring a tent, I didn't bring a bivy, I didn't bring a sleeping bag. Um, I've got lots of spruce boughs that I can cut down, cover the ground. So if we do sleep here tonight, then it's going to be just open air essentially. And we'll be counting on the fire to keep us warm and uh, being on top of those spruce boughs that keep us off the ground, to keep us insulated from the cold ground, cold snow. What are you doing up there? Let's go through the gear quickly before the battery dies yet again. I have a couple of batteries in my pocket, but I'm still going through them really quickly. I brought a little bit of keg spice for the rabbits. <laughs> got lucky they got one. I've got this uh, venison jerky that I've been sharing with Callie. That'll, I'm not sure how many calories are there, but anyway, it's going to get us through the night. Got a warmer hat. Actually, I might need to put that on now because it's starting to cool off. In fact, I will do that. I have a first aid kit, small medical, what sportsman series, medical kit, whitetail, whatever that is, for one to four people. I always have, I've got probably three or four different first aid kits of varying sizes that go through them regularly to make sure I've got what I need. Then I've got extra stuff as well, typically. That's just common sense. Uh, it's not absolutely critical I rarely use it but it's worth having when you when I do need it and of course I can use it for Callie as well if she gets injured I always have my uh, these down vests uh, down uh, jackets I've got a vest in this case and a full length jacket these two downy down filled vests and jackets uh, upper body stuff I find that keeps me extremely warm no matter what the temperature is I've been stationary at a spot camping spot like this down to minus 40 and been quite comfortable so i always recommend that because packs down to nothing you can put that in literally in a pocket yet it provides way more insulated value than than something quite much bulkier like a wool blanket or something like that or other types of clothing so i always carry those even on midsummer canoe trips because if i dunk in the water and for some reason it's uh, water's still cold or it gets cold outside or it's cold at night. Um, throwing that on, even if I strip down and throw those things on, it actually keeps me warm. So what I'll do when I'm around water is I'll have these in a, like a Ziploc bag so they're completely watertight. Uh, basically clothing is the main thing for this. So if I sleep tonight outside, I'll put on long underwear. I've got top and bottom here. I don't normally wear long underwear in the winter cause when I'm moving or working, like traveling or working, because I overheat. I can't wear them. I've got a pair of extra wool socks for the same reason. I have a pair of gloves. These are fishing gloves with neoprene palms, and that's in a Ziploc bag. To, again, to keep it dry. 
I have sharpening stone, uh, grinding stone for my axe. I have my little mini survival shotgun that I shot the rabbit with this morning. Little folding thing. This is completely legal in Canada. Uh, folds up nicely and goes into a pack. That's not something I use on a like a real hunting trip or something, but if I'm just going on a little trip like this and, and hope to run into some small game, then that's ideal just to stick in the pack. The top pouch, I'll zoom right in here and show you what I've got. Spare battery for the camera, spare SD cards, uh, headlamp, always nice to have light at this time of year when it gets dark early. Got some purification tabs because I, in this case, I didn't bring a, a stainless steel container or a titanium container. Typically, I would have a little pot if I was planning on cooking or for boiling water and um, um, or a cup, a stainless steel cup that I can boil water in as well. I have matches, lighters, a whistle for uh, signaling, and I have snare wire for small game. I have my small sort of like a forest axe like a small forest axe that's made by Toronto blacksmith made that for me last year and I have my one liter Nalgene water bottle and then I have my traditional snowshoes that's it other oh, uh, a little bit of paracord here and a couple of shotgun shells in my pocket So I want to talk about fire starting quickly. Um, I'm not sure if I showed it in this video at the beginning or not, but uh, I use this fire steel. Which by the way, I don't see a difference from one to the other. What I find makes the biggest spark is the sharpest uh, uh, scratch tool. Um, so steel edge, so essentially sharp back of a knife like if you were in a pinch and couldn't get a good spark off a ferro rod with the back of your knife because it didn't have a very sharp spine the worst case scenario is you take turn your knife around use the actual sharp part of the blade you can get a really good spark off of that don't recommend it because it can actually score your knife or break or uh, burn your knife edge or, or break it wouldn't recommend it but other than that any ferro rod ferrisium rod um, fire steel whatever you want to call it is effective but practice with that because it's actually not as easy as you think it is <laughs> uh, the reason for that is that a couple of things one is to get it to be really effective to make sure you get a good fire going you want to scrape a whole bunch of that that ferrisium or magnesium if you're using a different type of thing um, onto whatever you're trying to light and then get sparks to light that but you'll see with birch bark it's not as simple as just creating a spark onto a birch bark or dry wood or something it won't catch you actually have to scrape the birch bark and create sort of birch bark powder that will ignite a lot better than the raw birch bark will so that's uh, one thing I want to mention but again practice with this but I wouldn't count on this in wet conditions unless you are practiced with it it's 100 percent effective if you're good with it and that and you're patient and you're good at fire making but there's nothing quite like this for fire starting pick lighter this is a mini one these aren't great i wouldn't recommend carrying mini ones i don't know how i ended up with a whole bunch of them but i've got two or three in my pockets right now that I found in my pack and I've got a full uh, a couple of full size ones as well fire is the thing that's going to save your life in the survival situation uh, 
for the obvious reason that it keeps you warm fire keeps you warm it can dry you out prevent hypothermia also cooks food that may be inedible or unpalatable if it's not cooked and it sterilizes water if you have a proper vessel to, to sterilize to boil water in so absolutely critical that you can start fires uh, there's no point fooling around and just you know carrying a fire steel or, or thinking you're going to start a fire with a bow drill or a hand drill two also very difficult techniques or even a flint and steel um, i will get into all, all of those other uh, methods of fire starting in future videos i have been doing that kind of stuff since i was a young boy and i just don't find it all that useful to be honest but um, in a pinch it's something that's worthwhile knowing um, and the reason i don't care about it so much i don't focus on that is that i've just learned that you need multiple ways to start a fire which means carrying multiple lighters for the most part that should be your absolute first line of of defense for fire starting and uh, secondly would be matches so i've got these um, uh, what do they call it? the hurricane matches in here uh, strike anywhere a little bit of cotton in there to, to help ignite which i can soak in oil to make it even better or wax I have in my pocket another. These are typically all in uh, Ziploc bags as well. And the Vic Pick lighters and little bags. Also, um, not every one of them, but some of them. Yeah, what else? Got some more matches here. So all these fire making tools are redundant. So this is the primary one that you're going to want to probably have in your front pocket of your pants. <clears throat> I make sure I have them everywhere so I'll have one in my jacket I'll have one in my inner jacket I'll have one or two in my pockets I always have one in my life jacket and I'm always wearing my life jacket when I'm out on a lake or a decent sized river that's cold especially in the spring on a lake a big lake that I can get separated from my gear um, I'm wearing my life jacket uh, all the time the only time I'm not usually is in a small stream or river where if I fall over I'm literally walking to shore and uh, you know, maybe I should wear it all the time and set a better example, but it's just the way I, I do it. Um, the life jacket, though, has to have some emergency gear in it. So I try to have a big enough life jacket or big enough pockets in it that I can have an emergency blanket, fire starting, starting methods, maybe even a, uh, something to eat, some tablets for um, uh, purif purifying water, a couple of things like that. Yeah, the risk is real that your canoe floats away if you capsize and your gear is tied into the canoe or stays with the canoe or or it floats away separately so always worthwhile or always necessary to have at least your fire starting tools on your body at all time whether it's in your shorts or pants or a shirt or or a pack a fanny pack that that that's attached to you at all times whatever it is always have that as well as backups in your other parts of your gear so this beaver pond behind me is the other part of why I chose this uh, spot for campsite. Melting snow is is fine. It's great for um, for drinking. It's you don't have to purify it. It's clean. Although there's a lot of debris in the snow right now. Um, problem is it uses a lot of energy because depending on the snow density, water density in the snow or quantity for a ratio. It uh, takes a long time to melt it down, so it's much easier if you can get a water direct from a water source, like a stream, ideally. Or now at this time of year, because we had some warm spells, beaver ponds like this aren't frozen underneath all this snow. So if I step down at the edge of this pond, I'm actually getting water coming up. So I just filled my water bottle from that and then uh, put purification tablets in it. Uh, ideally, like I said, I would have had a stainless bottle with me instead but I just didn't bring one this time. So water source, shelter, lots of firewood, um, privacy is what I'm looking for. So I like the remote spots. I like access to fish and game if possible. If I was on a trip uh, for multi-day, I'd set up closer to a lake and I'd have my ice fishing gear, or I would find a swampier spot that's got more rabbits in it. But uh, this, this works perfectly, this campsite works perfectly for what we're doing tonight and today. So I have my Baffin boots that are good down to minus 40. I'll take these off uh, before bedtime, dry, uh, take the liners out, dry them by the fire without catching them on fire or melting them. 
and then put them back on before I go to sleep. Uh, this Gore-Tex bib, um, I bought it as rain gear years ago and I've been using it for working around the cabin mostly and for winter. So it's not insulated, but it is Gore-Tex, so it's fairly waterproof. Um, and that's all I typically need to keep me warm. It's something waterproof so the water doesn't saturate it, snow doesn't saturate it. Um, then this up this jacket is uh, again not super insulated it's quilted but there's no down or anything in that it's wax cotton and it's made by Outback Trading and I find this uh, very durable for one thing uh, quite waterproof and stops the wind so that that's the kind of shell that I like and then when I stop like I said usually I'll put the down jacket or vest underneath this this will keep it that down dry and keep the wind from passing through it, but that's what keeps me warm. Um, the hat, the Outback um, uh, River Guide hat or whatever that is, you know that I usually wear brimmed hats like that. Keeps the sun out, stops the rain from falling down your collar and everything else. So it's a it's a good style of hat. I like wearing that. It uh, was fine for hiking because I don't want to overheat. It's perfect for for that today. But then once I stop, there's no ear protection on it, and it's not warm, it's just waterproof. So that's what I switched to this uh, fur-lined, uh, rabbit-lined uh, uh, hat from uh, Crown Caps, I think it is. So that's it, that's all of my gear. That's everything I need to spend a, a day out here and a night if necessary. And like I said, I think we are gonna stay the night. And uh, I don't need any gear. If you know, if you got this minimal stuff, and you're able to keep a fire going so you know you have enough firewood which will keep you warm collecting all that firewood too and you want to have more than you think you need so i'll need to bring in a whole bunch more to to, to make sure i've got enough to go through the whole night since i don't have any other way of keeping warm and uh, we'll get up tomorrow and it's going to be a sunny day up close closer to zero eventually so we'll get up and get active get warm and then uh, continue on and, and explore more of the land back here so it's nice to be able to do that with one light pack without having to bring a whole huge backpack full of gear like sleeping bags and tents and tarps and stoves and all that kind of stuff. I'd much, much rather be able to just live off the land, essentially live with the land, um, use the trees that we have so much in abundance of here as, uh, as methods to keep warm like the boughs on the ground and boughs even on top and all that kind of stuff. Snow shelter is lots of snow to create a little Quincy or cave here so I don't need anything else. Uh, I don't recommend doing that typically if you don't have the experience doing it but it's a worthwhile goal to get to that point where you don't need all those extra things to, to spend a night in the outdoors com fairly comfortably. Anyway that's it I'm going to uh, get into this rabbit it looks about done so I'll eat that and share it with Callie and, and uh, start uh, collecting some more firewood before it gets dark out. So thanks for watching this video. I uh, really appreciate if you could let me know what you think of this type of video on this channel, whether you think it's appropriate here, whether you're interested in seeing more of this kind of stuff, or uh, if you're not interested, whether you think I should just stick it on the other channel where I tend to uh, talk to the audience a little bit more. Either way, appreciate you watching this one, and I do look forward to seeing you up here at the cabin next time. So take care and have a great week.